Up until now, whenever we've encountered a use of digital signatures, we've made an assumption that the party verifying the signature had the proper public key, as well as an assurance that they had the right key. It turns out that ensuring this is a fairly complex topic that I want to spend a little time on. There are several aspects of managing these public keys that we need to cover in order to understand how it is possible for various parties to trust public keys and to be able to associate them with a particular identity. As I mentioned before, one possible way of doing this is to communicate the public key through some channel that itself can be trusted. For securing a firmware image, the signing public key can be embedded directly into the bootloader in the factory. Since firmware upgrades are relatively rare compared to transferring something like sensor data and are likely to always going to be generated by the same party, this approach works reasonably well. In fact, this is currently the only method supported by MCU boot. This can also work to some measure for the device identity key. The key can be installed in the factory and the public key communicated via some out-of-band mechanism, say writing it to a secure device and delivering that by courier. Even when a more complex approach is needed, there will still usually be a need to have an initial key that is stored this way in order to establish the beginning of the trust of these keys. When things get more complicated than this, say when there's multiple parties participating, where one party may want to delegate this trust, we need a more complex mechanism. And this is where what are known as certificates come in. I will start by going over the concept of a certificate in general, and then we'll look at some of the specifics of X.509, the most commonly used certificate format. After this, we'll discuss the infrastructure built around X.509 certificates and some other mechanisms that can be used. Recalling back when we covered digital signatures, each key pair is made up of two parts, a public key and a private key. Each of these is encoded as a small block of data. The private key must be kept as a secret to the party that is signing the messages. The other can be and in fact needs to be somewhat public. But these keys are just numbers and there's nothing inherent about a given key to associate it with a given party. What a certificate does is that it bundles a public key together with a block of identifying data, and then that whole message is signed with the digital signature. In the simple case, a certificate can be what is known as a self-signed certificate. Here, the private key associated with the attached public key is used to sign the message. Since anyone can generate a key pair, attach whatever data they wish to it, and sign it, it might be hard to see what the value is in this kind of signature. Indeed, there isn't much value in this, except that it provides a convenient way to associate the identifying information with the given public key. Generally, these self-signed certificates are delivered through an out-of-band manner, similar to what I described earlier as just storing a public key. This helps identify at least who the key belongs to, as long as it actually came from a trusted source. When these certificates become powerful is when the signature associated with a given key is signed with a different key pair than the one contained within the signature. This allows the party owning the self-signed certificate to vouch for this additional certificate. Now this chain can be arbitrarily long, although it's generally kept to just one or two levels. Beyond this, trust gets kind of complicated to reason about, and the keys are easier to mismanage. So what this certificate chain allows for, for example, is that the device only needs to store a small number of these so-called root certificates in the device itself. As long as the certificate chain sent during the handshake is ultimately signed by one of these trusted root certificates, the device is able to trust the key at the other end of the chain. Now, I don't have time here to go into all of the details of X509 itself, other than some key points. Essentially, X509 defines a specific format and an encoding of the information in the certificate, which includes the public key, the identity of the certificate owner, in a format known as a distinguished name, and attributes on how the key in the certificate can be used, such as whether it's allowed to sign other certificates. Now, over the years that X509 has been around, numerous extensions have been defined, some made mandatory 
to allow keys to be associated with host names, IP addresses, email addresses, and other things like this. The certificate, including the signature, is encoded using a format known as ASN1, specifically with its distinguished encoding rules, which ensures that the given data will always be encoded the same way. Now, an advantage of using X509 is that there are several implementations of it available that address a lot of the difficulties of implementing it securely, such as all the rules necessary to determine if a certificate chain is valid. The format itself is somewhat archaic, and although there have been some efforts to make something more modern, none have really gained much traction. I think one of the reasons for X509's persistence is because it is used in what is known as the public key infrastructure. When you connect to a website using your browser, the website will send your browser a certificate chain. The browser has a small list of certificates owned by trusted parties that it requires these certificate chains to ultimately be signed by. As such, to be able to have an HTTPS website, you have to go through one of these trusted parties. Small plug for Let's Encrypt, by the way, they're one of the trusted parties in most browsers and have an automated mechanism that allows you to generate certificates for websites all without charge. This has been a large part of why so much of the web is now accessible via HTTPS. It's possible to use certificates and certificate chains without using this primary PKI. Doing this will generally save money, sometimes a considerable amount, but it does require that the entity running their own PKI establish and maintain the necessary trust. If this is entirely within a single organization, this is certainly possible. But when multiple parties become involved, these external trust vendors generally provide a useful service. So we've covered certificates and X509, but really only related them to such uses as secured websites. In the final part, I'll cover how certificates can be used within IoT devices.